Yeah, we don't need the speaker since we're doing the talking. All right, and uh, we are recording. So everybody, uh, welcome to our uh, pod webcast podcast. Um, this is a recap of the session that we gave at uh, KubeCon last week, but with more time uh, to sort of review the material and, and go through uh, what's going on with Digital Rebar and how Digital Rebar is providing this, this service. The focus of today is about immutable infrastructure, and we're going to be using immutable infrastructure to install Kubernetes, and then we're going to also be talking about some new capabilities we built into Digital Rebar version 3.4 that enable some atomic locking so the cluster is self-forming. So not only are we doing immutable boot, um, but we are also doing self-building clusters. Um, and so if you give me a moment, I will pull up the presentation that we gave last week. Um, we're assuming that you have some background in Digital Rebar um, and, and don't need us to show you installs. There's a lot of videos and things like that, but we will go through the process uh, pretty carefully. Uh, I'm going to run the demo and then Greg is going to uh, win man for me so that uh, he can point out some uh, some of the features and some of the different capabilities that we've we've been enabling in the system as we go. And let me put on screen for you. And if you have questions, uh, comments, uh, I, I have the chat open and I can watch um, uh, messages come in on the chat. So please feel, fr uh, feel free to go ahead and, and add or uh, make comments and we will address them as they come up. Let me double check to make sure that, uh, and as far as I can tell the recording, we are recording the uh, session. So let me let me share the screen for the KubeCon presentation, and I'll get all the way back up to the top. So I'm hoping everybody can see that uh, just fine. Looking for a thumbs up from Stephen. Okay, I lost it. So, zero touch configuration pattern uh, is something that we've been working for quite a while. If you're familiar with the rack end history with uh, digital rebar, uh, we've, we've really worked. Uh, historically on figuring out ways to create ongoing provisioning patterns. So it's not just a question of spinning something up on day one, it's, it's really a question for us of how you create ongoing automation, what does day two look like uh, from that perspective. And we found uh, immutability is, is a very exciting topic for people, we'll touch on that. Um, uh, and then we've also uh, been seeing less and less need for configuration management patterns and more need for um, sort of the zero touch configuration where systems are self building and then we're much more likely to tear them down and reset them than try to continually uh, migrate and, and tune and, and touch configuration automation. Uh, and so in this demo we're going to be talking about this immutable bootstrap. It's new if you haven't seen it. And in the Kubernetes, uh, if we have time at the end, we'll talk about some Kubernetes features that have been coming. Um, and what our take on them is. You might have heard of them as node admission, uh, dynamic kubelet configuration, um, and we'll give you what, what we think is the real dope on those and where they are. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, my name is Rob Hirschfeld with RackM, um, and we've been doing a lot in Kubernetes, OpenStack, uh, physical provisioning, automation. Um, lately, we've been doing a lot of discussions around ed edge infrastructure. Um, we have a podcast pretty exclusively dedicated uh, to that called the latest shiny um, and uh, we'll provide some information about that and how to get in touch with that. Um, 
And so if you've been tracking this in the past, we've talked quite a bit about something called KubeSpray. KubeSpray is an Ansible playbook that installs Kubernetes. Um, it's great. Uh, I presented about this at um, OpenStack Sydney, uh, and there's a bit.ly link to the presentation that we gave. Um, it's a great way to install Kubernetes. It, it builds HA clusters. It does upgradable clusters. And it's Ansible. And uh, if you're familiar with Digital Rebar 3x, Ansible integrations, um, you can literally just pull dynamic inventory straight out of Digital Rebar and build clusters that way with no additional configuration. It's very straightforward. It works really well. Um, however, uh, it's not everybody wants to do, Coop, to do Ansible. Uh, the challenge with Ansible is that it requires you to have an externalized and central orchestration. So you're, you're going to be running Ansible playbooks from somewhere. Uh, it also means that you're going to have to have an inventory built. Digital Rebar makes that easy, but you still have to pick nodes to go in and out. Um, you have to have SSH enabled uh, to make this work. Uh, makes immutable booting harder. We really think immutable booting is very interesting. I'll explain immutability in a minute. And it's a little bit slow. Uh, it can take 20 or 30 minutes um, to build a cluster to completion because it's just building everything at, you know, sort of as it goes and, and Ansible itself is, is slow. It takes, takes a lot of time to make all this stuff go. There's a lot of protections you get from that speed, but if you're just adding a worker into a cluster, that's overkill, uh, frankly. And so what we want to be able to do is show a pattern uh, and then be able to implement that pattern in field and, and extend it that, that took advantage of immutability. So immutable infrastructure is, is, is servers, uh, VMs, however you want to use them, that follow this create, destroy, repeat pattern. So instead of going in and taking a machine that we would patch and then update and then change, what we literally do is we destroy the machine, destroy the machine's configuration and data, and then we reinstall it. Uh, and in VMs, that's really easy. You create a new machine and you patch it, pass it through the system. Physical infrastructure, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, we're doing it uh, in two different ways. One of them is using an in-memory boot image process, and then the other one um, is actually installing to disk. And then every time you want to fix things, you're literally taking it back through the whole install process. Uh, sounds onerous, but it's actually pretty simple with what we've done with Digital Rebar. It's a reset and just click and go. Um, and so the fastest way to make that go in this demo that we're going to give, even though it's very fast now, could actually be even faster by pre-baking images with Docker installed on them and the Kubernetes packages and things like that. So um, it's, a, it's really a way that you can create a lot of speed and performance in, a, in an infrastructure by, by putting more and more things in your images, just like an AMI rollout would go in, in Amazon. Uh, and what we find is it's very repeatable and predictable. Uh, so you know exactly what you're installing. You're not relying on, on configuration management to drag things in off the internet and hope that it's right. Uh, those images tend to be very safe and repeatable. Uh, they're easier to configure since the, everything drops in the node. Um, there's caveats, and we, we can talk about caveats uh, during questions. Um, and I keep saying this because it's, it's, it's true and motivating. It's, it's faster. So let's step, take two steps back and focus on what we're going to show for the demo. The demo is about Kubernetes. Uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, there's something called kubeadm or Kube, Kube Admin, um, And that is uh, one of the ways it's emerging as a preferred community installer. Uh, it's not perfect. It, it's, it's still under development, but it's very, very common. So if you're installing Kubernetes for the first time, most people we know are using Kubeadm to make that happen. And it's pretty simple. Uh, you initialize a cluster. That initialization gives you a, a token back and a string that says join nodes with this token. You, you run that step, and you pretty much get a cluster at the end of it. Um, and that's, that's it. It's, it's wonderfully simple. Uh, HA and upgrade patterns and things like that are still emerging out of, out of that community. Um, but for just bootstrapping a token, it's very powerful. Or if you already have a cluster running and you want to join uh, new nodes into that cluster, uh, kubeadmin is a very simple way to, to join nodes into an existing cluster. It's that, those two steps in there. But it's also not complete. Uh, 
we actually want to get this stuff running by using uh, by prereqs, and so you have to bootstrap a system for Kube ADM that includes an operating system, right? That is network access between all the nodes. You need some disks because Docker is going to run and, and needs some needs some disk. Conceivably, you could skip that step, but um, the the defaults really assume attached storage, so you need that, and then you need Docker. Uh, and once those three steps are done, then you can run kubeadmin, Kube which is exactly what we're doing. Um, and of course, to automate that, we have to have control mechanisms. So uh, for us, Digital Rebar includes uh, a, a agent or what we call the runner. Um, it's dissolvable, so it doesn't have to stay on the system. Uh, in the demos we're going to give, it's being set up to stay on the system so that we can keep control of the infrastructure. But no SSH is required. Um, we actually have some been talking in the community about the digital rebar runner paradigm and the task queues and things like that. And you'll get to see some of that in action. Uh, and this is the, what the demo will be, just to give you some landmarks in it. We'll have multiple nodes. I, I have two clusters. Um, they're already bootstrapped to have an installed operating system. The workflows will install Docker um, and attach the disks. And then they will come in, we'll run what we call crib. Um, Kubernetes, Kubeadmin, uh, Rebar Immutable Boot infrastructure. Uh, that will run Kubeadm init. It'll elect a master, run Kubeadm init, generate the, the cluster, and then run Kubeadm join on all the other systems. So pretty straightforward uh, process. Um, and we'll show you how that's automated to work automatically. And if we wanted, we could keep adding nodes into the infrastructure. It's pretty straightforward to go through that process. Uh, and at that point, we'll have a complete cluster. Um, one thing that I, I pointed out during the Kubernetes talk, and I think is worth installing, is or it, we're saying is this is not a Kubernetes installer. Uh, this is using community tooling to install Kubernetes in a repeatable, automated way. It's not building a custom installer. Uh, there's we just talked about two great tools that that you can use to install Kubernetes that are fully in the community. And at RackN, we believe that that's the right pattern. So there's no RackN proprietary secret sauce Kubernetes installer. Um, what we do is underlay automation. And with that, the, the stuff that the community is building actually works very easily um, without, without any drama. So let's get right to the demo um, and, and give you a feel for how this is going to work. So to do that, I need to stop sharing my screen. Hello again. Any, I don't see any questions in the chat, so we're good. And okay. So hopefully people can see the uh, screen that I've set up. I'm trying not to make the screen too big so that you can you can expand the resolution and see things pretty clearly. I need to log in to my system and make sure I have all my logins done. So let's go through and just make sure. So this is a digital rebar screen. Um, this is one of our favorite screens. It's the bulk action screen. So um, you can see I've, I've actually built two six node clusters in here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'm logged into the Racken portal. So uh, there's no requirement uh, in using Digital Rebar that you create Racken credentials and that you come in, although it does enable some advanced features in the UX um, and, and makes it available for you to download uh, content that we've been maintaining in Racken. And, and right now, the, the crib demo that we're showing you is in the Racken content sets uh, under our catalog. Uh, and those are those are things that evolve as we get more participation. We we're, you're welcome to. It's all available. You can click and download, and I'll show you how to do that process. Also, it's part of it. But first, I sort of want to jump through the demo and, and show you where things go. Uh, so in this case, I've got 12, 12 nodes in the infrastructure. Um, they're all in this sledgehammer wait state. So the way digital rebar works is that you can build workflows. 
those workflows basically take you from one known stage of the system into other stages. So this system has been set up so that when I have a system that I've never seen before, it goes directly into a discovery stage. That's a setting. By default, we don't do anything. So you, you do it in building a new system. You have to go and tell it you want to move new systems into discovery. So from discover, uh, my stage map is going to then uh, register me with packet. These, we're running this whole demo out of packet.net. Um, which is where we suggest people who are just trying out digital rebar give that a shot. Um, you can completely manage the Pixie Boot provision process there. Um, it's a very effective way to, to get the infrastructure running. Um, and then it just moves, moves into Sledgehammer Wait. Uh, Sledgehammer is our discovery image. And so at the Sledgehammer Wait state, uh, the system will pause and, and wait for additional input from us. Uh, so this is a very safe way to do it. We have other workflows set up. This one is uh, for building a, an in-memory Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then the, and in this case, what we would do is the same initial steps. Uh, when I'm ready to do a, an, another workflow, which I'm about to start, I would mount the local disks. I would install Docker. I would go ahead and run the crib install process, which I'll, I'll walk you us through after I've started it. And then we're going to go back to Sledgehammer Wait. Um, so in this in this process, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we do have another process that will kick off uh, where we actually install CentOS, we install SH keys, we set up the runner as a service. So once that system is installed, then we can come back, install Docker, and do crib. It's the same workflow. We're just doing it from an installed operating system instead of the in-memory operating system. The other thing I need to do is I have these two profiles set up. Profiles in digital rebar are ways to uh, collect attributes for a machine or parameters for a machine uh, and then make them available for all of the nodes that you've assigned in, into, a, into a profile. They're not exclusive, so you can have multiple pro machines and multiple profiles. Um, it's, it's really a way for us to collect parameters together and then make them accessible um, in, in pretty generic ways. And so the things you'll see is I already showed you the cluster map in graphical form, the change stage map and cluster. In, and then we've also identified that this cluster profile is the name of the, the cluster. And what's going to happen is as crib runs in the background, it's going to send information back to this uh, profile. And you'll see that accumulate um, about how the cluster is, which machine has been elected the master, and, and other information. So this will become the holding point for, for all of the data about this cluster. Uh, it'd be perfectly possible for me to build 10 different Kubernetes clusters and identify them this way. And then the systems would build 10 different Kubernetes clusters. Is there anything I'm overlooking, Greg, in describing? Excellent. It's giving me a thumbs up. So what I need to do here is I need to take, take my machines. And I'm going to grab this new demo set for this. And right now, they're just, these are basically, they've come up, they've been uh, identified as packet machines. I need to go ahead and say that they are part of this uh, cluster RAM profile. And so what I've, what I've done is I've now put, put these machines into that, into that profile I just showed you. Uh, and then the next stage for me to, to go is to Go ahead and tell it that I want to start the new workflow, which means telling it to start at the mount local disks. And from that, that step, the system, because it's in the sledgehammer uh, in this wait state, it's going to go ahead and start picking up the work. And you can see it already making the changes behind the scenes as it's picking up that work. So the system, um, in making that change, uh, set a set, I'll, I'll go ahead and bring up a machine. What it's done is it's created a task list. Um, inside of each stage, there's a task list. That task list is then executed by the system. When those tasks finish, it will move to the next stage in the workflow until it completes the workflow. Um, and that's literally what's going on right here. I can jump over to this stage. And uh, in this case, it's a running stage, so we haven't really done anything yet, but it started a job, a live log of that job. So as that Docker install completes, we we'll actually get real feedback. Um, and then I could jump further back in time and see other, other work that's been done as part of this stage transition for this machine. Um, 
So in this case, I can go watch, and if I, if I look at this cluster RAM profile, I don't have anything yet. Once I get to the crib install, it'll start populating material here. Let me show you what that looks like. So the crib install stage here uh, has only one task in it. That one task is crib install. The crib install task has just one thing, one template. So this is, I'm trying to show you the composability of the way the system operates. So I could have multiple, and we, we probably over time will decompose crib into multiple tasks and multiple stages to give, give uh, operators some more options and choices with this. But in this case, the stage has one task, the task has one template. That template contains all of the logic that's necessary, and there's really not very much, to elect a master, uh, run kub admin, if it's not the master, run uh, kube join when or kube admin join when when that information shows back up, um, and then collect the configuration file back into the system. Um, but it's it's really a pretty pretty straightforward bash file. Um, and one of the things that I like to point out here is that it, this is GoLang templating. So inside of these templates, we do parameter expansion, and you can do things like have logic. You can actually make choices. You can pull data from other parts of the system, depending on how you want to influence uh, the deployment, including, say, don't have parameters and just take, uh, and just take defaults. And that would allow you to inject uh, kube admin choices into the profile build, but still have a safe default infrastructure. Greg, did you want to make comments? All right. So if I come back to my profile at this point, what you'll see here is that we've already started collecting data as the system progresses through the process. Um, oh, and I should show you, everything that we're doing generates events back from the system. So uh, kube admin, or sorry, digital rebar uh, has a webhook, the UX subscribes to it. So everything that you're show, we're showing you, uh, events are being fed back. Those could be tied into any system that you wanted. Uh, if you wanted to externalize the digital rebar process and these immutable boots, you could actually have systems that um, received updates immediately when changes were taken and then they could take their own actions or you could just code it into the system. In, in this case, you'll see that jobs are actually progressing. I see that data coming through and the UX live updated to get uh, the different join instructions. So in this case, not only has this machine been identified as the master now, uh, Kube, ad, Kube admin init has created the join instructions so our other systems can join and our configuration file has been generated. So I can actually attach to the cluster. If I jump back over to bulk actions, oh, everybody's done. So um, that is pretty straightforward. What I'm gonna do in the background, I'm gonna show you the, that Kubernetes cluster in a moment. I'm gonna take these other machines and I'm gonna put them in the other profile so that we can, we can build that also. It takes a little bit more time. Uh, so I'm gonna do a, a full install cluster pattern here. And then for that, I'm going to go ahead and I need to put them in a sense seven, not boot environment, a sense seven stage. Um, and when I go ahead and do that, it's gonna, it's gonna get them ready to do a sense seven install. Um, I still need to reboot the machines uh, to kick off that install, install process. If I was using, say, a Terraform provider, Terraform provider would take some of these actions for me automatically. So um, we've also been working to integrate these two pieces together so that you could use Terraform to make these same changes that I'm doing via the UX. Um, you could actually build a Terraform plan that would do exactly these same changes for you from a Terraform run. So if you like, if you like CLI-driven actions, then that makes it, it pretty straightforward. This is gonna take a little while to go, um, so in the meantime, what I want to do is take this second demo, and I'm going to need to jump over to CLIs for this. So you're going to get a set. I'm going to pause this screen. I can figure out where to stop it. There we go. And instead, I'm going to share my CLI terminal. Good. So you can see I was, I was just doing a test run um, before this. So what, what I want to show here 
Um, let's see, I can I actually be a little. So this is the digital rebar CLI. I've already attached it to the remote system uh, by telling it that my endpoint was remote. Um, and <laughs> there's a lot of data in this in this profile. What I just the command I just typed is a digital rebar command that's showing me all of the data stored in that cluster profile. It's exactly what I showed you on the UX. Um, and so you can see all of the parameters are, are available in there. What I really want to do is, is not have to cut and paste anything. Uh, so I'm going to take that same CLI command. I'm going to go ahead and get, so I'm getting this uh, parameter, this profiles parameter, and I just need this one cluster admin conf parameter. Uh, crib is stuffing that whole configuration file back into that one parameter. And so I'm going to take it, I'm going to generate my admin conf file. This conf file is what Kubernetes needs to run kube cuddle commands or kube control as an authenticated user. So this is going to include my authentication. It's also going to identify where my cluster is and what the, what the master nodes are. So that one file has all of the information I need to actually run and use this cluster. So if I say uh, kubectl, give it the configuration file and get nodes, uh, the system is going to talk to that new master server and it's going to bring back all the information about the cluster. So I have full access control to the cluster here um, without having done anything. So I'm going to step back for a second, right? We literally took raw machines, we assigned them to a profile uh, and told it to start a workflow. I've done nothing additionally to configure this cluster. And in the process, the cluster elected a master by itself. It used that master information to do its own configuration, share the configuration information back to all the other nodes in the clusters, and then they automatically executed and joined that cluster. Um, and then to retrieve that information, we had stored all of the information necessary back into Digital Rebar so that I was able to uh, pull the configuration file back and then remotely access my cluster. Uh, so truly zero touch configuration on Kubernetes in this case. Uh, and if I want to access the machine, now th this is a very simple cluster. We didn't set up ingress rules or egress rules or things like that. Those, are, those would be required to build a real production cluster. Uh, but in this case, uh, kubectl actually has everything we need. There's a proxy instruction that allows me to say, talk through this port to that cluster directly. So I don't have to build a load balancer, an API gateway. Um, I can bypass all of that through uh, kubectl and talk directly. And I'm going to have to close my browser to do that, but it's worth showing you. So if I come back to my web browser, I can go into, and there's, it didn't ask me for authentication. It's using the authentication configuration file that I've already got to validate that I'm a, I'm a user in the system. So this is the Kubernetes API running. If I wanted to see the UI, the UI is installed by default here, and this is the Kubernetes UI for that system. It's the same nodes uh, running in that infrastructure, and then I could start uh, installing extra pods, installing services, building up this infrastructure in a consistent way. So at this point, my Kubernetes installation is completely done. All right, I'm going to pause for a second and take questions. Um, let's see if so I've been uh, not watching my Zoom screen to see if we have uh, questions in the infrastructure in the background. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So, Greg, is there any, we, we, we did a whole bunch of stuff really fast. I'm going to pause for a second. Uh, and there's, there's some really interesting technology uh, components that we built to make all this stuff work. The most interesting one to me is the atomic locking feature uh, to allow the, cluster, the, the server election, the master election piece. Uh, you want to take a second and explain how that, how that worked and what, what was going on with that? So for digital rebar provision, 
we chose to continue the pattern we'd used for digital rebirth version two, which was have the patch operator um, along with the traditional CRUD JSON operators. That allows us to send a JSON patch object per RFC 1601 or something like that. That allows you to specify things you want to update, add, replace, remove. Additionally, it allows you to send test operators. That allows you to do things like only set this value if it's currently at this value. That way, you can do things like let me get the object, let me update that object, and then when I go to put it back, make sure it hasn't changed. So we use that, uh, and that's available across all the objects in Digital Rebar Provision. We use that in this case as part of the crib install task to elect one of the nodes master. So in this case, we look to see if the profile has a master set. If it's set, we use it. If it's not set, every node that's there at that instant tries to set themselves as master. Uh, one of them will win, and that one becomes the master. The rest then wait for the uh, join command to show up so that it can then join to the rest of the cluster. And, and this is not specific to Kubernetes at all. This is general general function that you could use for any type of locking. So. I know that we also uh, added it into the way we were working with our Terraform integration. Yeah. Terraform uses it to allocate nodes from a pool so that if you use the DRP machine resource, you can get a machine from a pool inside DRP or then run your rest of your Terraform against. Um, that becomes an atomic operation so you don't end up with multiple users using the same machine. Okay. So this, this is something that we've, we've seen a need for quite a bit in the past with configuration systems. When we were dealing with a lot of chef style provisioning, um, if you were doing a task or even Ansible provisioning, if you're doing a, a task as part of a, a flow and it's across nodes, you very often need to make sure that all of the nodes are synchronized in one way or another, or one node takes, takes priority, has to get something done first. Um, the need to have a centralized lock that is a, that is guaranteed atomic um, really enables some very basic but important uh, configuration deployment options. We've seen people sort of hack around with a locking file or a shared file in, in sort of a storage infrastructure using memcache or things like that to do it. Um, and we've never been very happy with the way those, those infrastructures work. Uh, the alternative has been what we see Ansible having to do, which is you declare everything in inventory up front. And in that case, when everything's known and predefined, you can run these infrastructures pretty quickly. The, the challenge with that is it, it ends up causing people to have to do a lot of front-loaded work, and it makes the systems not particularly resilient after the fact. So on day two, you now have to keep that inventory modified. You have to keep everything up to date. Um, with what we're talking about doing right now, you could actually cascade information through a cluster by, by moving, allowing them to figure out who leads or where locks were. Um, you could actually create some gates that would say, don't take these nodes down because I already have nodes coming down and do some types of handoff work. Um, there's other ways to do it also. Uh, we just, we felt like this was, was very safe, minimalistic. Uh, approach from a provisioning point of view of, of making all this stuff happen. Okay. Ah, good. We have some questions. So the lock, so the question is, is the lock we're talking about in Sledgehammer or the runner? Um, the, the lock is not in Sledgehammer. The lock is an interaction between the API and the digital rebar CLI. Do you want to? The, the lock is actually in the profile residing oh, in digital rebars system. What we're using is we're using the atomic operations of the patch operator to update that profile atomically. So that way each node, when it goes to request and take an action against that profile, the, the DRP endpoint acts as a synchronization point for those operations. 
and only one of them can actually succeed in, in setting that value initially. And it's generic behavior for the how the API interacts. So any actually, it doesn't have to be even the CLI. Yeah, it's really based on patch the patch behavior of the uh, API. Correct. And so it resides in the DRP endpoint. So yes, in the running server. Um, some of this is it's it's actually very straightforward from using the JSON patch uh, protocol for the REST APIs. And we encoded uh, some, some ways to leverage that into the CLI also. So yeah, in, in this case, we chose to leave the runner uh, running on each instance. That's a, so in the RAM case, we were in Sledgehammer and Sledgehammer just kind of leaves the runner running. In the case of the CentOS, uh, system which is making progress behind and I think is complete for the updates and stuff that were going on in the UI that we can see. Um, we chose a workflow that caused a runner to run in the operating system post install. So that way it continues to run and, and makes progress. Right. We have questions in the Q&A and I'm trying to figure out how to get them. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second. See if I can get figure out how to open up my Q&A question. So there's a question that how does this differ than a console setup from HashiCorp? Well, console is really just a key value store. Now, strangely enough, we could use that as the backing store for digital rebar provision, but we don't. Um, well, we, so, there are two different things, right? Console is making the decision about um, how and who has the latest version of the key value store, and you can get HA properties of the key value store for using console. Digital Rebar provision, while kind of, you could say, built on top of a key value store, because that's what effectively our backend database is, um, is actually, driving provisioning operations, it's managing templating systems, it's running a DHCP server, it's managing interactions between the objects. So it's it's a level above and beyond uh, what a console does. Hopefully that answers your question. And if, if you're trying to use the Q&A feature, it, it's showing me that we have two questions in Q&A, but I, I, I cannot figure out how to, how to have Zoom show me the, the Q&A feature. So let's just please repeat them in the group chat and I'll, we'll, pick, we'll pick them up. Uh, I'm gonna, there's something else I wanna show you as far as actually building this infrastructure yourself. So let me go over here. And then if, if we get more questions, uh, just go ahead and type them in into the chat and we will see them. Let's see. So, uh, you can easily replicate all the steps we're doing. That's, that's part of our goal with this. Um, installing digital rebar itself is very straightforward. And then the workflows that we're building um, are really very basic uh, workflows that you would you enable through in the content packages system. Let me move this out of the way. Um, what you'll see is we have a crib content uh, package. This package uh, right now, I've installed it. If I was to pick a, um, a different endpoint, uh, I wouldn't have crib installed. Let me sh let me see if I can do that. So this this is just using my local my local system, and in this case, what I would do is I would find uh, crib on my content list. And I can just transfer it in to my, this is my local system. So that's the process for actually pulling down the, the resource. Uh, since I just pulled this one down, it's, it's up to date. Um, if I was looking at my, uh, the endpoint I'm giving the demo through, over here, this content system, um, as we patch it, you'll actually get new updates and changes. And so part of the way the system works is as we enhance and change uh, the content, you don't have to, you don't have to upgrade digital rebar. 
uh, endpoints, you can just download the new content. And in this case, I'm going to leave. I'll leave it going in. What's going in now? Because I don't want to retest. Be change your uh, running system, but you can go in and review basically all of the components that go into uh, the crib infrastructure. And then if you wanted to, you can add some things in like the task library uh, is needed if you want to set up the uh, runner as a long running process. So uh, that's also installed in the system because we install the runner to stay resident in, in these deployments. Um, so the, the CentOS boot process, I'll show you that in a moment, um, had that. The, the th one thing to point out is if, if you're not familiar with Digital Rebar yet, um, there's a lot of pieces, right? We are very strong proponents of composable automation, meaning we, we don't want to give you a single file that does all of the scripting automation pieces. We, we know that that leads to madness very quickly, makes it very hard to maintain things in the field. So we deliver uh, this content as a package that you download all of the bits and pieces, the decomposed pieces together. So in this, in the crib package, you're going to see there's parameters that are predefined, there's stages that are predefined uh, that I've been using. Uh, the tasks that we've been talking about are also in here, and so are the templates. Uh, and all of this, once I import it into the system, comes in read-only. So if I'm looking at the crib install, I can't actually edit this. It's a read-only template. If I want to make changes and build my own crib install, maybe with additional post-provisioning tasks, I would clone this, and then I would start making enhancements or changes against it. Um, that allows us to create updates to these templates, fix bugs, make changes, and then uh, since you're not able to change those source pieces, we will be able to keep patching your system, improving it, um, and enhancing. Uh, and that allows the community to really work together on building um, automation in, in a reusable way because the things that are different from site to site can be isolated uh, in a much smaller unit of work. Uh, so that's the stages and tasks. Let me see how these machines are doing. All right, and so we actually have completed the second install now. Um, so this, this Kubernetes install is not only um, using the crib, it actually also installed Sense 7 fully and then went through the process. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader uh, to imagine us connecting into that, that infrastructure. But the difference here is that those that we've chosen to make go to a complete state, and they do not keep Sledgehammer running from a, a late perspective. If I wanted to rebuild this cluster, uh, all I would have to do to rebuild the cluster is come back into this profile. I need to remove. Uh, the data, the token data that identify this cluster as a unique cluster. Uh, and so I'm, I can literally just destroy these pieces. I need to leave the profile string in and then come back into the those systems, identify the machines. And this is where Terraform is handy because Terraform would literally do this step for us by destroying the infrastructure. Um, but all I have to do is I'm going to pause these so they don't start working until I'm ready for them to. I'm going to change the stage back to discover. And then I will go ahead and power cycle them. And once they come back online, they're going to move back through. This is a reset. Um, the workflows are two steps of the workflow. If I merge the workflows together, they, could li they would literally go through the bit rebuild process for me. Um, and if I had in my profile, I'd already identified a master to join to. Um, by specifying, you know, if I had a cluster already going, I could just say, join this master, and then all the nodes would just come straight back into the cluster for me automatically. The workflow is intentionally designed to require a two-step process. So, I, so all you have to imagine is instead of sledgehammer wait, I could just put mount local disks attached to packet discover, and it would complete the cluster bring up for me. All right. Let me pause and see if there's questions in the Zoom. Uh, we do have questions, a lot of questions. Excellent. Um, the Rack and Web portal is not open source. Uh, it is it is part of what Rack and maintains. Um, it is not. You do not require a lot. You do you do not require a Rack and login to use the portal. So we maintain the portal as a community uh, service for Digital Rebar. 
there are, if you do register, there are additional features and it's part of our support package um, for that. But you don't, you don't have to be a Racken customer to use the web portal. Uh, this next question is, can digital rebar provision clusters without using the Racken portal? Yes. Um, you can, you, everything I'm showing you, the Racken portal is just a React uh, single page app. So it's using the APIs. Uh, you can drive everything we're showing you through the CLI or the APIs um, or in Terraform um, because Terraform, the, the newest uh, patches we just made to Terraform uh, are starting to expose some capabilities. Um, with regard to the endpoint of DRP, um, is a Pixie content server, yes, that is one of its functions as well. So it's managing that environment. We actually view it as kind of four pieces. There's a DHCP server, there's a uh, file server, there's a TFTP server, and I don't know, something else. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, but the idea is that uh, as the machines go through various states, the stages and boot environments and tasks create templated files that get served to those machines. Those machine, those files get put into a, the namespace for the TFTP server, the file server, um, all of those things. So it's kind of, yes, it's a Pixie content server and more, right? right. Oh. It, it's, what we've been finding as we do more workflows in the task expansion system is that the template expansion capabilities that we've built um, have general utility beyond kickstarts and precedes. That's really where the 3.0 system was really using templating to serve kickstarts and precedes. Uh, the workflows that we're showing now, we're actually building tasks and scripts uh, effectively as expanded templates. Uh, so then we have another question, uh, when would you want a multiple endpoints then? There's a lot of use cases for multiple endpoints. Uh, the simplest one, most obvious, is if you have multiple data centers uh, and you want to do, you want to provision the multiple data centers, you would have multiple endpoints. And so you'd be able to switch back and forth. Um, for management, one of the things that Racken is building uh, is multiple endpoint synchronization and management utilities. It's, it's part of our, our enterprise value added feature set. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to manage multiple endpoints. We're also seeing interest from edge infrastructure where you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of distributed locations and you want to manage the infrastructure in a very consistent way. That would be another multiple endpoint scenario. Uh, and we have had discussions about um, using digital rebar instead of as a centralized provisioning infrastructure per data center to actually create multiple digital rebar endpoints in a single data center. Uh, for example, in top of rack switches, you digital rebar could run, it's very low, low overhead. Uh, it could run in a top of rack switch and then be responsible for provisioning all the servers per switch. Um, and that would create a degree of redundancy within the infrastructure. So. Uh, lots of cases where multiple endpoints are possible. Uh, and if you wanted to just run thousands of servers off of an endpoint, you could certainly do that too. Uh, pausing for some more questions, and then I can we can talk through the end of the Kubernetes uh, discussion and demo from that perspective. Uh, one thing one thing I should note is that once you've um, taken the content and and brought in content, it's just going to show up in as, as stages and, and everything else, and so you'll you'll see it from that. For packet, uh, if you're using packet, um, you'll want to uh, bring in the packet IPMI plugin. Um, this doesn't actually do IPMI; it uses the packet APIs to simulate IPMI. Uh, but it has features that allow you to identify machines and then the power controls uh, that I've been leveraging here are if your IPMI simulated controls, um, they're enabled by having the packet plugin. 
Um, they're only available if you have a plugin for IPMI, for Packet, for VirtualBox, or one of the different um, API extension points we've, we've done with plugins. Once again, those, those are in the endpoint. They are, they are downloaded uh, content, and everything we're showing you, you can, of course, do through the CLI or the API from, from that perspective. Okay. Cool. Don't, uh, if you have more questions, please keep coming, keep, keep them coming in. I'm going to jump back and, and do the last couple of slides from the Kubernetes uh, presentation we gave because uh, they have some interesting, they have some interesting aspects from a digital rebar uh, perspective. So switch back to that. So in, in the demo that we showed, we're, we're super proud of, of the work we've done. Uh, in discussions we've been having, and in, even internally, we know that there, there are places where we want to see this continue. Um, right? Adding those requires you to have a token. Um, we've, we've been, we really handled that, we think, pretty well. There's still ways to, that you could improve the token injection process. Uh, Kubelet requires configuration. Uh, which is what Kube, Kube Admin is doing, but it's we're relying on Kube Admin to do that, so there, you have to be on the node doing it. And then there's the, the cluster API, so there's still some orchestration. The ways people have been talking about doing this are, are, are there's two major topics that we hear in, in Kubernetes operation circles. One is something called node admission, which basically says that nodes show up into a cluster they ask to be join the cluster, and then they they will automatically join it. Um, and so, in a case like that, you could see immutably bringing up a new node and then just having clusters magic or nodes magically join the cluster. Um, and it it would look uh, something like this. It's not a, a node specific uh, thing. It's part of an admission protocol that Kubernetes has. But basically, a new machine comes in. It creates Kubelet registers with the API server. The API server uh, delegates, is this a valid node to something else? That, that external system confirms it. And node's just an object type in Kubernetes. And then it would be added into the API server so that the relationship between API and Kubelet would be established. Um, so that allows you to not have random nodes show up and, and take on work. That would be bad. You don't want your container scheduled on untrusted nodes. Um, the challenge is that if you were going to try and do that with a hardware signing module and do an encrypt secure process, it ends up being a bit of a mess, um, right? And you have to have some way to take a trusted token, inject it into the kubelet, have that signed by the security module, then that encrypted token it can then be passed through the API server, which passes it to the external system, which passes it back to the original system. They can then decrypt it, uh, verify that it was there, and then run the system backwards. Um, and the security looks like this. You, know, they're, they're, you, need ex you need external trust. You need encryption. This in itself isn't that scary. It's a pretty logical process. But uh, when we think about this process versus just booting up nodes and bringing new nodes in, you, you have the trust relationship anyway. So when, when a node is brought into the cluster, and it's given a join instruction, that token is a trusted token already. So the idea of adding an extra layer of encryption and, and indirection seems to have diminishing re returns for us. Um, if we're bringing up a node and giving it that token, then that token should, should be enough to trust the node. Uh, if, your tr if your token is, getting cr uh, is not a secured token for joining the node, um, uh, then we have another problem, and then you, you'd want to look at HSM if you're really in that untrusted of an environment. So there, there's a place for this, but we think it's overkill right now. The other, the other thing that's worth pointing out is Kubelet dynamic configuration. And so um, the idea here is that we want to eliminate any additional configuration tools. So a, a node comes up, it says, here I am, Kubelet, the admin server has the node's configuration, 
sends that back to the, the node and the, all the configuration is basically done with profiles from the API server. So it's really a kubelet bootstrapping. And of course that means there's less tools, there's less infrastructure to manage. Um, this is something that, that I see people want to do quite a bit. I, I call it a bootstrapping fallacy, which is having systems that can bootstrap themselves. Um, you know, that's what bootstrapping is about, but it, it can be adding things into Kubernetes or OpenStack or another tool to handle bootstrapping that really aren't part of the constructs of the tool. And so it, it can get very sort of very strange feeling. This is, this is what it would look like if it was everything was going to work. I would bring up a Kubernetes, a, a kubelet. I, it would register. The API server would say, hey, I, right, first I put a, a configuration into the API server. Then kubelet would show up, would get its registration and go on its merry way. Uh, the reality ends up being more like this um, because of the way we have to inject configurations into the API server. So. First I install Kubelet, and then I configure it, and then it registers. Once it's registered, I can overwrite its configuration on the, I have, I have something I can configure against in the API server. Then I have to tell the Kubelet to use that configuration in the, in the system. And so I'm actually configuring the node three times uh, in two different places to make, make this work today. Um, obviously not a very elegant approach and our, our feeling on this is that once you've, once you've configured, once you have to inject configuration into the kubelet, you might as well just inject configuration into the kubelet and be done. Um, so doing it from the API server doesn't really save you anything if you have to touch the node and, and tell kubelet, you know, here's the API server, here's a token to join it, here's some information. Once you've done a little configuration, there's not, it's not a lot of lift to do more or all of the configuration that's necessary. Um, it's not really saving you tools or complexity in, in that infrastructure. So this is, these are really interesting topics. You know, they're, they're, they're making some great progress and, and likely our concerns will be addressed as we continue to iterate through these processes or in a cloud environment with CloudNet, you might feel like there's, there's less of a you know, there's more that's getting done that you, you you don't have to do. So it depends on your environment quite a bit. Um, but we're still watching um, where we go. And that's it uh, for the, the presentation. Uh, obviously, Digital Rebar, the, the community site is rebar.digital. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of information uh, following me. I'm Zico online, and I'm, I'm really active on Twitter, so I'd love to interact and discuss 